The night that everything happened, December 31st, my father came in to the house. And he was pale as a ghost, and he said to my mother, we're in very big trouble. The president has just left the country. in the square of the revolution, you are a very pretty man, Commandant. It's all I could say. Hello, this is Kirsten McCall in Cuba, and at the moment I'm sitting on the Playa Giron overlooking the Bahia de Cochinos, the Bay of Pigs. It's on the Caribbean coast, south of Havana, and is the site of one of the most famous episodes in Cuba's history. And I'm here because in this programme this week, I want to try and fill you in on the history of the Cuban Revolution. Now, that's a story that's taken well over 50 years, and I've got less than half an hour, so you're going to have to bear with me on this one, but I'll do my best. Here's a song that was written around the time of the 1959 revolution. It's called Ieneso Llego Fidel, and then came Fidel. Aquí pensaban seguir. Ganando el ciento por ciento con casas de apartamentos y echar al pueblo a sufrir y seguir de modo cruel contra el pueblo conspirando para seguirlo explotando y en eso llegó Fidel. Se acabó la diversión, llegó el comandante y mandó a parar. Se acabó la diversión, llegó el comandante y mandó a parar. Aquí pensaban seguir Tragando y tragando tierra Sin sospechar que en la sierra Se alumbraba el porvenir Y seguir de modo cruel La costumbre del delito Hacer de Cuba un garito Y en eso llegó Fidel Y se acabó la diversión Llegó el comandante y mandó a parar Y se acabó la diversión Llegó el comandante y mandó a parar Before the revolution, Cuba was run by a corrupt government headed by Batista, a former army sergeant. By 1958, most of Cuba's land, industry and essential services were in foreign hands, mostly American. And many in Batista's government, including him, were getting very rich on bribes and kickbacks. In 1956, Castro, brother Raul and Che, along with 80 other rebels, landed back in Cuba after a self-imposed exile in Mexico. Fidel had already led one failed attempt in 1953. Basically, after three years fighting from a base in the mountains of the Sierra Maestra, Batista fled, taking with him $40 million of government money. It was not a communist revolution. The Communist Party in Cuba took no part in the fighting. This is a small part of Castro's speech on January the 1st, 1960, the day after Batista had fled. There is not communism or Marxism in our idea. Our political philosophic is representative democracy and social justice in a well-planned economy. There is no communism or Marxism in our idea. Our political philosophy is representative democracy and social justice in a well-planned economy. In fact, Castro initially went to America to try and forge links with them, but Eisenhower, who was president at the time, wouldn't see him. In fact, he went on a golfing holiday instead, and Fidel went to see Richard Nixon, vice president, who accused Castro of being communist and sent him home. He also then authorised the CIA to fund Batista's Cuban exiles to invade Cuba. And during the next few years, the former head of Cuban security reckoned that there were approximately 600 plots to assassinate Fidel. Some of the ideas were patently ludicrous, exploding cigars, poison inside his wetsuit, a kind of poison that was going to be administered to his boot polish in order to make his beard fall out. But my own personal favourite was the idea of spraying a TV studio full of LSD so that he would end up with uncontrollable laughter, making him look like a complete clown. 
that's got to be the best one. The CIA also recruited former girlfriend Marie Lorenz, who was given cyanide capsules by the CIA to take to Cuba and put in his food. This comes from an American radio documentary. When I was on the way down, I was afraid I'd be searched at the airport. So on the plane, it, uh, they were in my makeup case. I put them in a jar of Pond's cold cream. They melted. They, they dissolved. So I, what was left of the mush that became the castles, I shoved deeper down into the cold cream so nobody would find them. But even if the pills had not dissolved, Marie Lorenz says she wouldn't have been able to go through with it. I'm no killer. I couldn't do it. I smelled the cigar smoke, and I, you know, even in the bathroom, I couldn't do it. I knew he was out in the other room. I just couldn't do it, and I knew I'd get problems. I felt almost afraid to come back to the United States. Aquí Tragando y tragando tierra, sin sospechar que en la sierra se alumbraba el porvenir y seguir de modo cruel la costumbre del delito, hacer de Cuba un garito y en eso llegó Fidel. Y se acabó la diversión, llegó el comandante y mandó a parar. Y se acabó la diversión, llegó el comandante y mandó a parar. This is Kirsty McColl in Cuba, and today I'm trying to tell you as much as I can in a very short space of time about the Cuban Revolution. Before the revolution, Cuban governments were corrupt, incompetent, and they discriminated against the black population. There was a lot of money about in the cities, but it was certainly divided amongst the haves and the have-nots, and those who lived in the country did so in abject poverty. So in many respects, the revolution has worked. Now there is education for all, a great health system, meningitis C vaccine was discovered here, the infant mortality rate is in fact lower than in Washington, D.C., and all Cubans are treated with absolute equality. Here is Cuban actor Hilda Oates. I was working as a domestic in Cuba when the revolution ha hadn't come. I was a, a, a cooker, a clean the houses of the white and rich people for 10 pesos mens uh, monthly. And when the revolution comes is when I could study to be an actress. And I went out of the place and I told the, the, the woman, I am going to be an actress. And she said, you are crazy because you are black. You, you, no, nobody would like to see you. That what the white woman with who I was working said to me. And I said, OK, I will be an actress. And I, don't know if I am, but I studied three years on a school that was open after Fidel Castro comes to the power uh, in Havana. He opened the schools for everybody, not for white, not for black, sino you know, for Cubans. Aquí pensaban seguir, jugando a la democracia, y el pueblo que en su desgracia se acabará de morir. Y seguir de modo cruel, sin cuidarse ni la forma, con el robo como norma, y en eso llegó Fidel. Y se acabó la diversión, llegó el comandante y mandó a parar. Y se acabó la diversión, llegó el comandante y mandó a parar. So I'm at the Bay of Pigs on Cuba's south coast, and it was on April the 14th, 1961, that 1,400 Cuban exiles, trained by the CIA, landed here to try and overthrow Fidel Castro just 18 months after his revolution. Castro took charge of the defense personally. After 72 hours, they surrendered. 200 of the invaders were killed. The survivors were exchanged for $53 million worth of food and medicine. The father of Miami Cuban, Gloria Estefan, was one of those Cuban exiles. My father was um, an escort to Batista's wife, to the First Lady. He was a motorcycle policeman. And uh, the night that everything happened, December 31st, when Batista left, my mother tells me that my father came in to the house, and he was pale as a ghost, and he said to my mother, we're in very big trouble. And he says, the president has just left the country, and things are going to be very bad. I want you to get ready, because I'm going to get you out of here the first chance we get. They had taken his father prisoner. He said, I have to go back. 
And my mother said, don't go back. He goes, no, I have to go back because my father's in jail and, you know, I have to go back. So then he went back and he was immediately jailed. And he spent a few days before they ironed out who was who and what happened. And as soon as he was uh, released, he came to Miami and he got a job. It was cleaning the, the toilets at uh, a bar and parking cars. He got my mother and I set up in a little apartment and then he told my mother, I'm joining the resistance that's going to go to Cuba. Uh, we're going to be trained, and I can't tell you where I'm going to be. It ended up that it was in Nicaragua. So we didn't know where he was. My mother and I were living alone in Miami. Um, some little apartments right behind the Orange Bowl uh, were a lot of small apartments, and they nicknamed it the barracks because it was two lines of one of apartments facing each other, and all the women there had their husbands in this uh, Bay of Pigs invasion force that was going. My mother would tell me that my father was at a farm, and I knew exactly that he was in jail in Cuba because after Bay of Pigs, he was captured. Uh, the whole thing was a big fiasco, so they were all captured. But my mother didn't know for many months what had come of my father, what had become of him. Because a lot of men were killed, and by the time we got the information, it's not like now that you see everything right away. It was it took months. Compañeros poetas, tomando en cuenta los últimos sucesos. En la poesía quisiera preguntar Me urge ¿Qué tipo de adjetivos se deben usar para hacer El poema de un barco sin que se haga sentimental Fuera de la vanguardia O evidente panfleto Si debo usar palabras como flota cubana de pesca y playa girón. Compañeros de música tomando en cuenta esas politonales y audaces canciones. Quisiera preguntar, me urge, ¿qué tipo de armonía se debe usar para hacer la canción de este barco con hombres de poca niñez? Hombres y solamente hombres sobre cubierta, hombres negros. Y azules los hombres que pueblan el Playa Girón. Silvio Rodriguez there with the Playa Girón. And that's the beach I'm sitting on at the Bay of Pigs. The early 60s were turbulent. After the Bay of Pigs came the Cuban Missile Crisis. Castro had forged economic links with Russia because of the US embargo. They had to sell their sugar, and Russia offered very favorable terms, seeing Cuba as a great strategic base, being so close to the USA. In April 1962, Khrushchev resolved to send more missiles to Cuba. Kennedy ordered the US Navy to turn back the Cuban-bound missile ships. The world was on the brink of a nuclear war. It just happens that at the same time, a group of Cuban musicians were in Russia on tour. One of them was singer Ibrahim Ferrer, who met Khrushchev. The Russian leader expressed his concern about having to deal with Cuba. Bueno, estando nosotros allí en en Moscú, fuimos a Amo en el Teatro Bolshoi. We were in Moscow and we were playing in big places like the Bolshoi Theater, which I think is one of the biggest places for opera music there. And we gave a big concert and we were invited to go up to a reception. That's Pancho Alonso, Carlos Querel and myself where Nikita Khrushchev was going to be. And it was up in some building on, the, on one of the top floors. And we went to this reception and we were introduced to Nikita Khrushchev, who I have to tell you is quite a small man, bald. And um, he called us over to a table where he was sitting. And um, he's got an amazing sense of humor. He's always making jokes. And he sat down, he was incredibly friendly. He touched my head and stroked my back and said, you're Cuban, you're black. And he was really pleased to see us. And he told us lots of jokes. He had an interpreter with him and just spoke as if they were speaking for him themselves. And then suddenly he said to me, like a joke, he said, um, 
you know, how would you feel if you had to pick up a sea urchin with your hand? And I said, well, you know, why on earth would I do that? That's impossible. He said, yes, because if you, if you pick up a, a sea urchin with your hand, the, the spines stick into your hand. And that's Cuba now. That's what it is. Vete, por favor. No me atormente. Grábate en tu mente. Nuestra despedida. Ya no queda nada. De la cita que ya. Diluvio de besos, tempestad de amor, ansias incontables de unir nuestras vidas. Y a pesar de todo, partir fue mi muerte. Murieron mis ilusiones y no resucitaron. I have uh, today been informed by Chairman Khrushchev that all of the IL-28 bombers now in Cuba will be withdrawn in 30 days. Chairman Khrushchev, it will be recalled, agreed to remove from Cuba all weapons systems capable of offensive use. We on our part agree that once these adequate arrangements for verification had been established, we would remove our naval quarantine and give assurances against an invasion of Cuba. That was President Kennedy with the news of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And now I've driven 70 miles north from the Bay of Pigs to Santa Clara, which is one of the most important cities associated with the revolution. It was where Che and Fidel and the others had made a huge stronghold in this part of the island, and Batista was determined to prevent them from getting any further west towards Havana. So he sent down 10,000 troops here to try and destroy the rebels, and we're right in front of a train wreck which has been preserved as a museum to show one way in which the rebels managed to thwart Batista's troops. 300 odd of them were coming in on this armored train when Che's men managed to pull up the tracks with a very small bulldozer, causing the train to derail and crash. From then on, it was very easy to ambush Batista's men. The bulldozer's over there on a big lump of concrete and the carriages have been left right where they crashed. One of the other things about Santa Clara is that it's the home of a huge memorial to Ernesto Che Guevara. We haven't mentioned Che much in the series so far, but most people know him as a principal figure of the revolution. Che Guevara was in fact an Argentinian doctor who'd met up with Fidel in Mexico. Fidel had been imprisoned by Batista's government for his first attempt at revolution. When he got out of prison, he went off to Mexico because he was under surveillance in Cuba, so he thought he'd get out for a bit. And it was while he was in Mexico that he met up with Che and managed to organize a load of others who were into the cause and would be up for coming back to Cuba and starting a revolution. So he managed to get hold of a boat with the rather sweet name of Grandma. It was only an eight berth boat, but 82 of them managed to get on and set off for Cuba, where they ran out of petrol about 35 kilometers from the coast. Che later said it was not so much a landing, more of a shipwreck. So essentially Che Guevara led the revolution with Fidel He's absolutely revered throughout Cuba still. After the revolution, he stayed here for about four years in a sort of governmental post, but then there wasn't enough action in that for him, so he went off to the Congo, and then later to Bolivia, where he was captured by CIA-backed Bolivian troops and executed. It's really hard to describe the impact Che Guevara had on this island. Wherever you go, you see his image painted on the walls, and anybody who's ever met him speaks about him with great affection. Here's Hilda Oates. The favorite one was when I met Che Guevara in the plaza, the square of the revolution, once. And I see him, and I, he was walking into the crowd, and the people was shouting, here is Che, here is Che. 
And when I see him, he was just beside me. And I got uh, nervous to see a man so important like him. And I wanted to say many things, sure. I wanted to say I thanks him for coming to Cuba and struggle for us as Fidel does. And I couldn't say anything. I only could say, <laughs> you are a very pretty man, Comandante. It's all I could say. And he said, he smiled. He smiled at me. And he keep walking through the crowd. Aprendimos a quererte desde la histórica altura donde el sol de tu bravura le puso cerco a la muerte. Aquí se queda la clara la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia comandante llegue That was Carlos Puebla with Hasta Siempre, probably one of the most popular songs about Che. The US embargo continues even today. Ill feeling between Miami Cubans and the Cubans here has continued over the years. Most families have someone who has left to live in the USA. There's a lot of sadness. I'll leave the last word with musician and band leader Juan de Marcos. I'm a Cuban and I live, I live in my country because I'm lucky. There are many Cubans living in different countries of the world, mostly in America. It's important to say that in spite of our different points of view, political, social, doesn't matter, we have only one country, we have only one culture, and we have only one identity. I went to Miami, I remember, in 1999, no, 98, and I met a lady in downtown in Miami, and we were talking, and said, well, I'm Cuban. She said, well, I'm Cuban as well. She asked me, where do you live? I said, well, I live in Havana, Cuba. So she said, no, you are not a real Cuban. You are a Castro Cuban. So I think that it should be possible to, to do something against this uh, stupid point of view of certain people, not only Miami, but here in my country, here in Cuba as well. Because we are not politicians, we are the people. We have only one country, we have one identity, we have one language, our own Spanish. So it's important to keep alive these uh, uh, facts. And uh, that's why I wrote this song. And right now I can say that every time I play this song in, in America, many people cry. And here in Cuba as well. Because the, the, the refrain says, here is my hand. And I ask from my heart that between all the Cubans start the reconciliation. We are at the region the 21st century. It's time to stop the shit. Buscando de otra vida tú te fuiste y regresar triunfante fue tu anhelo pero la incomprensión tendió su velo Y no entendimos bien lo que tú hiciste. Ay, se fue llenando el corazón de ti. Fueron creciendo las dudas e intrigas. Y la que al daño fue miraba mi vida. Mira hoy con celos todo lo que es mío. Pero mi bien está.
la próspera vivimos con el orgullo de sentirnos cubanos, con el orgullo de sentirnos cubanos. Aquí te entrego mi mano pidiéndole el corazón, que entre todos los cubanos haya reconciliación. That was the Afro-Cuban All-Stars and Reconciliation. Next week, I'm back in Old Havana, getting a taste for Cuba's cars, bars, and cigars. I'm Kirsty McColl, and this was a Smooth Operations production. Wonderful stuff and a great program, and one that's proving to be a fitting tribute, I think, to the late Kirsty McColl.